Welcome back to the Gutsiest Brands podcast, a show built around understanding the DNA of gutsy brands by talking to the world's most innovative brand leaders. I'm your host, Emily Eichelberger. At GutCheck, we make it our business to understand brands. And over the years, we've learned that gutsy brands have a lot of common factors. In fact, we've identified four primary criteria that help us measure a gutsy brand. We feature brands that are empathetic, pioneering, bold, and demonstrate what we call the power of and, those that see opportunity where others force trade-off. When we find a brand leader that we think embodies gutsiness, we invite them on the show to explore what makes them so successful, what drives them every day, and to get their perspective on other brands rising to the ranks of gutsy. In today's episode, Gut Check CRO Jess Gedeke, a former leader at Nielsen, chats with Lauren Wong, the founder and CEO of The Flex Company, the top-selling sustainable period care brand who is blazing a trail by making periods more comfortable. After Lauren spent 15 years suffering from infections from menstrual products, she decided to change the status quo, not just for herself, but for menstruators everywhere. She set out to create period products that were more innovative sustainable, and made for the 21st century. Lauren embodies gutsiness. Today, she'll talk about her path to entrepreneurship, the obstacles success comes with, expanding from direct to customer to mainstream retail, and how she convinced people who don't menstruate to get behind her product. And you'll have to decide for yourself, but I think Lauren has the most creative song choice yet. Kick back and enjoy another episode of the Gutsiest Brands podcast. Lauren, it's so nice to have you here with us today. Uh, We were introduced through Karen Howland, who was a guest on another episode. And ever since her mention of you and of Flex as a gutsy and innovative leader, I have been so looking forward to this conversation. I am glad the day has finally come. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. I'm really excited to be here and have nothing but good things to say about Karen as well. Yeah, that was a really inspiring talk about her and Circle Up and how they think about investing in gutsy brands. So let's get right to that because I have a founder here that I want to learn from. So introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about uh, Flex. Sure. My name is Lauren Wong and I'm the founder and CEO of the Flex Company. And the Flex Company is the top selling sustainable period care brand. And what we're really known for is creating a more comfortable period for everyone. It's a pretty important mission, and we'll get to how you do that and your journey to doing that, Um, but that's a great way to kick us off. So in in terms of your background, Lauren, and, and where you come from, you've talked about how you didn't grow up in a monetarily wealthy environment. So making, you know, this move into entrepreneurism was a really big deal. So what made you decide to make that bold move? How did you get that conviction to enter that what can be pretty scary world um, of being an entrepreneur? Yeah, it was absolutely terrifying. And the, I think the biggest thing that I tell other people who are thinking about starting their own business is no matter what background that you come from, like you're never truly ready. You're never going to feel like there's some moment that there's the light bulb goes on and you're, you're okay, let's go. I'm ready to do this now. Um, For me, it was a gradual realization. I was getting infections from my period products um, following every period for 15 years. It took me 15 years to figure out that my infections were even being caused by my tampons and pads. And when I started doing research and trying different period products from all over the world, and this is in, um, you know, between like 2011 and 2015, there weren't a lot of options. And in talking to other people about their periods, I learned that, you know, people don't really think about their period products, but a lot of people really hate their periods. And I thought, well, that's a shame because we're menstruating for about a quarter of our adult lives. Like, why should we hate that week every month? Like, why does it need to be uncomfortable? Why does it need to be disruptive? And I really believed that with a better set of period products and with more options for people to choose from that people could be able to 
kind of navigate that week and, and find options that work better for their bodies. Um, for things like cramping, leaking, bloating, pee string, doesn't have to be infections um, like me, but there's all kinds of period problems. And, you know, I just realized that no one else was doing it. No one was going to do it. And I had people asking me to make a period product for them. <laughs> so I kind of went kicking and screaming into it, but um, really with this idea that I wanted to try to, you know, help other people. Mm -hmm. That's what I cared about. Bold move, but centered on, you know, helping a human, which I love. And is part of how we think about the DNA of a gutsy brand. One aspect is just really grounding it in empathy. So we'll talk more about that as it pertains to your, how you approach product design and things in just a minute. But First, I want to give you some props. I was doing some research and reading, uh, you know, various levels of information. And I love how one of your investors gave you some praise. So let me just quote it real quick. Uh, this investor said she's heads down, focused on profitable growth, regularly reevaluating how marketing spend is converting, navigating the ups and downs with full transparency. There are so many powerhouse statements in that. And so you should be proud of that. But I really grabbed onto this idea of navigating the ups and downs with full transparency. What have some of those ups and downs been as you've launched a startup company? What can you share about the great times and the low times? Such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's uh, honestly, there's been so many over the last six years. Um, the first one that really comes to mind is back in 2018, I made the controversial decision to start selling our products in retail stores. At the time, we were only selling our product online direct to customer. And it might be really funny now to say that it was controversial, but at the time, um, most people on my team, most of my employees didn't think it made sense to sell in retail. Um, most of our investors didn't think it made sense to sell in retail. Direct to consumer was all the rage. You know, this is in the heyday of everybody had a subscription for everything. Right, right. And it was going really well. Um, but in talking to our customers, a lot of people said, you know, I wish I could just run to the store and get it when I need it. I don't always know when my period is going to come. I don't, you know, want to stock up. Why can't I just go to the store and buy it? And so again, like having that empathy, man, that would be really bad. Or if you're traveling and you get your period out of nowhere and you're yep. stuck and you're addicted to flex disc and you, you don't <laughs> want to use a tampon um, or a pad, you know, that was, that was, those were real stories I was hearing from people. Um, but we decided to do it and it nearly killed our business and not for the reason that you might imagine. It nearly killed us from a cash flow perspective because what I didn't realize was we were growing so quickly on the direct to consumer side. And then we had to build all this inventory to prepare for this national retail launch. You have to time up your cash flow pretty evenly. Mm -hmm. And we were maxing out our production at our manufacturer. Um, we have our own manufacturing equipment. All of our products are patented. So we can't just go and buy more of it somewhere else. We're making it ourselves, essentially. Um, so we are facing a shortfall of product and we were really tight on cash and I had to go around and call our investors and say, look, like this <laughs> like, might sound like a champagne problem. It's actually not a champagne problem because we're having to choose where we're sending this inventory and I'm going to need some additional capital to be able to cover things for a little while. And what I will tell you is I will go out and try to find other financing vehicles after the fact, but for right now, this is what I need to keep the business going. And thankfully we had amazing investors backing us and they came through, but it was just being really transparent and honest. And that was a big, big learning um, moment for me and learning moment for the team of uh, just <laughs> a completely different type of business model, right? Which is just retail. Right. Yeah, totally different story and a new set of stakeholders that you need to appeal to, new set of data that you probably needed to bring to bear. So balancing both of those at the same time must have been pretty, pretty challenging, but it sounds like you, again, navigated those ups and downs in a real solid way. So one aspect of being a gutsy brand is standing behind a bold idea, even if not well understood or appreciated in the moment. 
And so in 2016, you were pitching an idea about alternative period products to an investor community that was primarily male. How did you approach your pitch to make sure they understood the product benefits? If I could be a fly on the wall in 2016, I would do it because I would have loved to hear, to hear that pitch. So at the time when I started pitching Flex to investors, as you said, a lot of them were, were men. Um, most of the people that I talked to had never had a period. Um, many didn't even have children who menstruated either. So they're just broadly pretty unfamiliar with this idea. I needed to find a way to make this problem personal because when I first started trying to pitch the product and talking about there hasn't been any, any innovation since the 1920s when tampons were patented and you know the next big innovation came in the 50s and it was pads, just their eyes glazed over. <laughs> it didn't matter. Like 51% of the world <laughs> deals with this problem, didn't care. Um, so I tried making a little bit more personal by asking if they had, you know, a wife or a partner or a girlfriend or a daughter, someone in their lives, it still wasn't personal enough for them. And I thought, okay, there is one thing I can think of period sex. So I would ask them, do you enjoy having sex with women? Uh huh. Have you ever been turned down by your partner because they were on their period? Oh gosh. Yes. Uh huh. You have them nodding, which is like, <laughs> that is rule number one in sales. You can walk right. in and say, the sky is blue. And people are nodding, right? You got to <laughs> like find a way to relate to people and make it personal. And something like period sex is deeply personal. Personalizing it in a way that says, how about you don't get denied sex while your partner's on her period, but also mess free sex right? Is that another way that you made it personal to them and ways that they could visualize the product benefit? At the point that I got them to tell me, which pretty much everyone, there was never a single person who had sex with a menstruator who had not had the experience of being rejected at some point or another for period sex. I would say, this is the product for mess-free period sex. And they're like, what? You know, <laughs> then at least they're curious to hear more. And it, it wasn't a product for mess free period sex. It was one of the benefits of a long list of benefits, 12 hour wear, blocks odor, body safe, longest wear disposable period product on the market, uh, doesn't cause infections. Like the list goes on, but it was that thing that I would kind of, it was the wedge that I would use to get them interested in hearing more and to hear me out. And from there I could say, and there's these other benefits and it's a really massive market and no one is paying attention to this problem. Um, and slowly, slowly I was able to kind of chip away at it, but it was tough early on because at the time there weren't investors like Circle Up out in the world that were looking for innovative CPG companies. And the landscape thankfully has changed a lot since. And there's been lots of other period companies that have come after us. And I'm deeply, deeply proud of that uh, because the change that I really wanted to see in this space has come about um, after years of hard work. It's so inspiring how you've paved the way there. And it's a category that's needed innovation for a hundred years. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just great to see the conversation and focused on that, that human that you're trying to help. So let's go there next. Let's really talk about how empathy plays a role for Flex. Um, it's threaded throughout the story and the product line, but there's a couple of aspects I really want to dig into here. And one is that you market to menstruators. You don't market by gender or age group like many of the other category leaders do. Why is that important? Why is that significant? I am really proud of the fact that we were the first brand to do this. I'm, I'm sure there are some other brands that might do it now, but it's not widespread if that's the case. I can't think of any other brands off the top of my head. Um, but when I was formulating the brand, and of course, a lot of this business came from empathy, empathy for investors, even empathy for our customers. Yeah. Um, I am a queer woman and I didn't feel that the brands that were available to me or other people that I knew in my life were representative of the people that I knew the people I surrounded myself with. Um, and it was really important that we build a bold brand that really stands for making people feel comfortable. And to me, what's more important 
then feeling like a brand that you're purchasing doesn't create gender dysphoria or doesn't um, contribute to ageism. Like that emotional feeling of comfort is just as important to me as the product benefit. So it's a, it's a 360 empathy strategy. Yeah. And we at Gut Check and, and me personally, I gravitate to those brands because they truly are changing lives. And it's all about connecting brands to people in a deeper way where you can make their life better and make them feel, feel proud of using your product. And that's what I observe from, from the stories and from what I've read and from what you just described. It's, it's so important and so powerful. So I, I just really appreciate you sharing it with the world. Um, and the other part to that in terms of empathy is you have a consumer led product design strategy. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about what that looks like. When you're a small company, you don't have the big budget of a CPG company. You know, I think of a company like Procter and Gamble who are best in the world at product innovation, right? They have so many teams and so many scientists and, you know, their investors expect them to be the leaders in innovation for so many different products. And they really are. If you don't have that luxury, the best thing that I know how to do is to get really, really close to the customer. And by that, I mean, we involve real people through every single step of the R&D process. And we have a true R&D team and they have a whole design philosophy and it's documented and it's a process and it's scalable and repeatable and all those good things. But it, it really starts with the why. Why does this product need to exist? Why is it different? What is its place in the world? There have been many products that... Um, People have asked us to sell or suggested that we sell that aren't our customers that would make money. And we've said no, because we really believe in doing things that are different and solving real problems. And there's nothing wrong with making money. You have to do both if you have a business, but we have limited time and limited resources. And we would rather spend that time really trying to solve for those genuine problems that people have going back to that promise of comfort. And so we take that feedback and we iterate on our product design, we iterate on our marketing messaging, we iterate on our brand, on our advertising strategy and everything that we do. And as I said earlier, even where we sell the products, if somebody told me today that they wanted to start buying, you know, period products at lemonade stands in their local neighborhood, I would find a way to do that. I would find a way to do that. So what strikes me there is, is discipline though. I mean, you have to have discipline to say no to those other money-making options. So how do you develop and nurture that discipline among your team? We have very, very clear values. We have a very clear mission statement. We have a very clear vision statement and a clear product vision statement. And our product vision statement, for example, was designed to be able to filter any kind of product idea that anyone would be able to come up with. And if you put it through this filter that we made, you're always going to come up with the right answer. It's always going to be a values aligned answer. It's always going to be true to our brand. It's always going to be true to our brand promise. Um, and so that kind of framework um, is really has what allowed me to pull out of a lot of the day-to-day conversations and empower the team to be able to take that vision and, and push it forward. You're almost making it sound too easy because this framework sounds like it's the blueprint. It's the North star. So where did you learn how to develop that framework? We came up with it to solve a problem. Um, and the problem was last year, the team um, came up with, we, we had grown a lot and hired a lot of new people and there was a time where I was on maternity leave and I came back and like processes had changed and things had changed. I give the team a lot of rope to be able to run. And they came up with the product and got pretty far along in the process to the point where the final packaging crossed my desk. And I said, what in the world <laughs> is this product? And they said, oh, this is a top seller in retail. All of our retail partners have told us if we, we make this, they're going to sell it. They're going to sell it everywhere. We will make money instantly. Look at the market size. Look at this opportunity. We've already developed it. It's done. It's ready to go. And I had to say, 
I'm so sorry, but no, <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> and, and having a postmortem with the team, I had learned that there were some folks who'd been on the team for years who, who felt really uncomfortable with this particular product concept, but they didn't, cause they felt like it was straying away from why the company was created, the why and the brand promise. And they didn't feel comfortable enough speaking up to kind of the new guard of people at the company. And they felt kind of like swept away in the, in the process. And so through those constructive conversations and through that postmortem, someone on the team had said, okay, let's kind of go back to a product vision statement and let's kind of work together to build a framework. We had the old guard and the new guard and me, the product development team, the research development team, the customer insights team. And over the course of, you know, several hours across, you know, a time period of a couple of months, we didn't spend all of the couple of months, but <laughs> over an extended period of time, we were able to develop this framework and it really works. It sounds like it's keeping you, you and your team grounded. And especially during a time of such rapid growth, it probably helps to, to serve as that backbone. So I think that's, I think that's important. That's an important part to think about. And, and what are some of the things that you think about as you move to scale? Um, you've already mentioned a couple of things, but I'd love to hear, especially, you know, from a advice perspective, advice you'd give others that are in similar parts of the growth curve. What are some of the things you have to think about? The most important leadership lesson that I'm working to tackle, and I have not fully figured it out, is when to step in and when to step out and how to communicate that to the team in a way where they are very clear on your expectations and they don't feel surprised in the moments when you step in or surprised in the moments when you step out. And every leader, as you scale, when you're tiny, you do a little bit of everything. And I'll say to the team, I've had every job on the team with the exception of you know, software engineering and accounting. Mm -hmm. Pretty much you're lucky everything else, out of those. <laughs> <laughs> everything else I did at some point, I'm not as good at any of those things as the current people on the team because we're a much bigger company now and I'm not a specialist in any of those areas. There are certain functional areas where my background and expertise, I just enjoy spending more time. Brand marketing, product development, retail sales. Those are like three areas where I'm always going to be involved, but every leader has their own flavor. Some people are engineering leaders, some people are product leaders. And so communicating that to the team, especially the folks that work in those departments, like, you know, this is what involvement from me looks like. This is how to work best with me. These are the kind of things that I want to see and when I want to see them. So they don't feel caught off guard. And the people that you're hiring are comfortable with that level of interaction and at the same time like finding that balance um of giving the framework and giving the rope but also knowing when things are off track and you've got to step in so i think that's one of the greatest challenges of scaling for any ceo mm -hmm. yeah it's an important lesson absolutely Another piece of gutsiness that, that we see is gutsy brands and gutsy founders, they tend to see opportunity where others force trade-offs. And I think Flex is such a perfect illustration of that because guess what? Your period products don't have to be made out of these certain materials that are in your body. You don't have to experience the discomfort that you have for years. So it's just such a clear illustration of it. But how do you do that from a technical perspective? Like, how did you tackle the problems that you were tackling with the true functional nature of the product you were developing? I think first it goes back to the why and being very clear on the why and not boiling the ocean on the why on like the what problem you're trying to solve. Very clear problem definition. I think the second piece is really understanding the reality in which you operate and regularly assess that reality because the reality is constantly changing. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more of that in a second. But the third piece is 
you know, once you understand that reality, understand the rules of that reality better than anyone and decide which of those rules you want to follow and which of those rules you want to break. And so for me, safety <laughs> and regulatory requirements mm -hmm. are things that I'm not going to break. So I started there. Once I had my problem definition, I was on the FDA website studying myself, calling experts, talking to other founders who had medical device companies, talking to, you know, 30, 40 year veterans in the medical device space. I spent the better part of six months just learning the regulatory reality in which we are going to operate before even then going into kind of product design because I wanted to understand what that was because I had made the decision that I didn't want to break any rules over there, especially by nature of me starting the company after getting so many infections. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other rules that I completely broke, like who I could raise money from and how I raised that money and how we launched the product. The product went viral for being a product for mess free period sex. And it was never intended. It was never what it was intended to be in the first place, right? It was around comfort. Um, but you know, you, you have to, as an entrepreneur, be really honest about the obstacles that you're facing and like the changes in that reality as they come up and get really creative about problem solving in those moments without breaking the rules, without compromising on the things that you said at the very beginning, you weren't going to compromise on. And if you're unclear about the why, or if you're unclear about the reality, or if you're unclear about which rules you're willing to break and which rules you're not, you're going to find yourself swept away in moments and maybe make some decisions that you wish you hadn't. And that idea of revisiting that reality over time is just such a smart piece of, of guidance because um, things do change. So many categories were fully disrupted because of the pandemic, for example. So now what's the new reality that we need to operate within and which of those rules are we still not willing to break? Um, I, I love that. I think that that's a perfect blueprint for how to remain true and to really make sure that you're pushing the right boundaries, right? Breaking the right rules. I love it. So I don't believe in years resolutions and I haven't for years, but I do pick a theme every year. And like one year it was expand, one year it was believe. <laughs> You're short and easy to remember. My theme for this year is this is your life. Because I think I realized in January that a piece of me was holding my breath and kind of waiting for something to go back. But then life was just moving forward and things are moving forward. And I lost uh, my grandmother to COVID and I'm like, man, this is it. You never know how many days you have. So this is your life. It's not changing. It's not going back. Got to keep moving forward. But that has translated into my business because with COVID came an explosion in e-commerce. And what that did is it's really squeezed a lot of the smaller players like Flex who were digitally native and thrived on direct to consumer marketing and a lot of these channels like Facebook and Instagram that we relied on for marketing previously don't work anymore. And I, what I, when I look around or when I talk to other founders who have omni-channel businesses like we do or have direct to consumer businesses, people are really struggling and everyone is kind of waiting in some way or looking like, like people are like looking around at each other. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> and nobody really knows. And what I've had to explain to my team is like, this is it. <laughs> this is our new reality. You know, the, the iOS 14 changes were what they were. The privacy laws are only going to keep evolving. We need to evolve as well. We need to change. And here's how we're going to change. Here's the new vision for you know, the flex business model. And here are all the other amazing things that we've built outside of that. Um, and let's just embrace it rather than fighting it or waiting for something else to change. So that is what I mean about constantly evaluating your reality. It's so true. And, you know, the businesses and the people, frankly, that find energy 
around this is the reality, but what's in my control right now? If I can manage the things that are in my control and manage those with a positive intention, with a, a real understanding of, of the reality, yeah. that, that's the best we can do. And the most successful people do that every day and they get up every day to do it again. So yeah, what a refreshing and important observation that is. And, and I love your idea of not setting a resolution, but, but a theme uh, for the year. So <laughs> I, I wish I could speed around and ask you, what have the last 10 years been? But that might be a little, a little too personal and going back into the memory banks. A little too personal. Yeah. Um, but I thank you. I appreciate that. The hardest thing is admitting when something isn't working, especially if something used to be your strength and all of a sudden it's your weakness, man, that is hard to admit. That is really hard to admit, but if you can admit it and take a step back, you might realize that you have all of these other strengths that maybe you forgot about. So like, let's play to those strengths rather than trying to fix this other piece that's super weak. Like let's double down on these other strengths. Okay, we're gonna to go to our first lightning round. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers here. And Lauren, we'd love to hear your perspective, even from a personal standpoint, as a consumer out there in the world. So feel free to um, think about brands that you admire and campaigns that you admire just as, as a person, in addition to, to a leader. So what I'd love to do is have you name the first brand or campaign that comes to mind. When we think about empathy, what's a brand or campaign that truly demonstrates they get people? I think Spanx. Oh, Spanx. Good one. Yeah. Spanx. They're, they're very ahead of their time and empathy for customers. They're just like, we all have bodies. <laughs> we want to feel good in them. Here's a product for that. No shame. And I also love that they weren't like in your face, wokeness in their brand. They were very like, this is a product for everyone. That's just reality. That's just how it is. It's for everybody. I love Sphinx. Okay. How about a brand or campaign that is pioneering? It creates a new way of thinking or doing business. Uh, gotta be my, my favorite business, which is Instacart, man. They were really ahead of it. They were like grocery delivery is going to be the future. And now they do all of their things, you know, other than just groceries, but they were on it. What about one, a brand or campaign that stands behind bold ideas, even if not popular at the time? Oh my gosh, I don't want to throw up just thinking about this, but Tesla. <laughs> she says with a sigh. Oh, uh, the Tesla. I mean, what they've done, like, you yep. know, you watch the Super Bowl this year. I don't know. Every car commercial was an electric car commercial and they're not electric cars anymore. They're just cars. That's all Tesla. Yeah, I observed that too. I think there were half a dozen uh, car commercials, electric car commercials. It's so interesting how things change. Can you think of a brand or a campaign that saw an opportunity where others forced compromise? I saw the founder and CEO of DoorDash speak years ago while we were in this program called Y Combinator. DoorDash was not nearly as big as they are now, but he was one of the most impressive CEOs I've ever heard speak. And he was talking about, at the time there was like Grubhub and Postmates and all these other delivery services. And he started with all different types of international food from small mom and pop places that nobody else was servicing. Everyone was doing the McDonald's and Subways and whatever. And he's like, you know, people want to eat from their like local place. And all these international foods are getting ignored. Boom. That's how they started. They found a way and they've, you know, outpaced everybody else in growth. Yeah. And helped how many mom and pop shops along the way, right? Just yeah. definitely a win-win business model. Talk to me about how you consider other brands in the category. Do you look at what has been done before in the period care product category and say, okay, here's what I want to do differently. Um, do you look at how they market how they message or how do you, how do you think about your marketing strategy? I'm really big on market research. So thinking about the reality in which we operate, 
I like to have a good grasp on the history um, and also like the current landscape. And when I say history, before I decided to start flex, I was thinking, I was like, how did people even start using tampons? When did we get comfortable sticking these pieces of cotton inside of our vaginas? Like, <laughs> when did, you know, we go from like that sanitary belt to a pad with adhesive, you know? So like, those are kind of my questions. And then obviously looked at what different brands have done over time. I certainly thought about some things that I'd wanted to do differently. I thought at the time, Kotex U was the, had done the most innovative thing with branding in the period care space that anyone had done, which they had changed their packaging to black when everybody else was kind of pink or purple at the time. And that led to tremendous growth um, and them stealing a lot of market share. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. They wanted to be really disruptive on shelf. But I thought the more interesting thing was the way that people would talk about Kotex when I would ask them about it, they felt this attachment to the brand, how it made them feel. And so once I had all that information in the back of my mind, you know, I just spent a lot of time talking to my customers to figure out what they or potential customers at the time, what they liked, what they cared about and formulated our brand off that. But there's also a little bit of sometimes people don't if you're doing something totally new and totally innovative, you're not going to hear the answer directly from the customer because there isn't something else out there like it to compare to. Right. So before people know about a menstrual disc, no one's going to describe a menstrual disc to you. Like I want this thing that's shaped like a Frisbee and I'm going to stick it in my vagina. <laughs> Nobody would say that. No one would say that. But what they will say is I hate running to the bathroom all the time during my period, I'm really worried about my product leaking. I have terrible cramps. You know, I, I skip my workout. Those are the clues that you pick up on. Um, and similar to, you know, building a brand, the look and feel of a brand or your messaging, those are the kind of clues I look for. So as time goes on, it's really easy to look around at competitors and see what they're doing. And I, refuse to do it. And I have to encourage my team regularly, like be aware of what other folks are doing, but just ignore them because nobody is us. Nobody has our values. Nobody has our customer set. And like, we are focused on our vision and executing on our vision. And I find that to be very freeing to not play the comparison game. It sounds freeing. I think I'm going to borrow that, that advice more than anything else I've heard today. <laughs> ignore oh your competitors. I think that that's really valuable advice. Oh, thanks. I mean, it gets frustrating. I think every job I've had, I've had competitors copy my work in one way or another. And it, it is a lesson I learned at a young age and it used to just frustrate me. And I remember my bosses at the time, it, it, again, had happened to me in multiple companies would say, oh, who cares? Don't worry about them. Imitation is the greatest form of flattery. But you know, you're early in your career and you don't <laughs> you don't want to hear that. But the reality is if people are copying you, it means that you're on to something and you're doing something right. Um, but if people are always copying you, you know what they're not doing? They're not listening to your, they're not talking to your customers and you are. So you're always going to be one step ahead. Okay, we're going to our, our next lightning round. This one's all about you. So spill your guts is what we call this section. What's the first brand you remember as a child? Oh, Coca-Cola. Are you still a consumer of Coca-Cola? Um, rarely, but you know, I worked at Coca-Cola um, for years um, in a marketing role. Um, I grew up in Atlanta and so Coca-Cola is kind of, it's everywhere. It's good. right. Right. <laughs> you're going to yeah. know about Coca-Cola as a, you know, as soon as you're out of the womb, how would you describe your job to a child? Ooh, I would tell them that I make things that help people with their menstrual cycles every month. What's one piece of advice you would give a business leader looking to help their brand be gutsy? absolutely ignore what other brands are doing. Stay close to your customer, listen to yourself, ignore every other brand. What is the most used emoji on your phone? Let me look. 
Yes, let's verify it. We're going to fact check. We're going to fact check you. It is the rolling on the floor laughing emoji. And do you use it once? Do you do like a double, a triple? Do you have a mode there? Depends on how funny it is, but I've been texting with my best friend a lot and she makes me laugh very hard. So recently there's been a lot of triples. <laughs> okay. And finally, in terms of the, the spill your guts round, we are compiling a gutsy brand playlist. What song would you add to it? Mm, I want to listen to this playlist. Um, I'm going to go with Cadenza by Yuxak, Polo, and Pan. One of the many great lessons that you've imparted to our listeners during our conversation today. I mean it when I say I learned a lot. You've given me a lot to think about um, in my own business, but also as I think about some of the brands out there that I admire and ones that we would call gutsy. So I appreciate so much, Lauren, all the lessons and the, the storytelling that you've given us. And congratulations again on forging a new way in a category that was pretty absent of innovation for many decades. So I know that you'll continue to do great things and we can't wait to see it. Thank you so much, Jessica. That's so kind. I had a lot of fun and I really appreciated all your questions. What an episode. Lauren has such an interesting origin story and I found myself completely enthralled with what you guys were talking about. Yeah. And I just think she was so genuine, but didn't it feel that way? She was yeah. so thoughtful in what she shared and so freaking smart. I just feel like we learned so many things in that conversation. I feel lucky to know her and glad we could hear her story. I didn't think that I'd be so fascinated by menstrual products, but I really was. And I did a bit of a deep dive after the call to just look at the innovation that we have come across. And I thought our listeners might enjoy a little bit of that timeline. So let's dig into it. The earliest historical evidence of the use of tampons comes from the Ebers papyrus. That's the oldest printed medical document. And in the document, it described how Egyptian women used wadded papyrus as tampons as early as 15th century BC. That's a long time ago. In the mm. 5th century BC, Greek women made tampons by wrapping material around small pieces of wood. And we see similar inventions throughout cultures all around the world. The modern tampon was created by Dr. Earl Haas and patented in 1931. That patent was bought by Gertrude Tenderick, who then formed the company Tampax and began selling it commercially in 1936. Leona Calmers, an actress, invented and patented the menstrual cup in 1937. The cup was made of latex rubber. In the 1950s, the band Peretz released a tampon that was lubricated for more comfort during insertion. And I'm not sure how long that was on the market. I meant to look that up, so I'll get back to you on that. While the tampon was widely available, many people still preferred an external product. So Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner, an African-American inventor, patented the sanitary belt in 1957. The belt. Yeah, okay. I mean, it holds it in place. It does its job. In 1969, Stay Free released the first pad with an adhesive strip, which was incredibly innovative. They didn't need the belt anymore, I guess. And by the 1980s, a significant portion of menstruators, about 70%, were using tampons. So we see lots of products, lots of failed innovation, such as the use of synthetic materials, which increased toxic shock syndrome. So thank goodness we have people like Lauren focused on making products that are not only convenient, but also safe. Well, I really appreciate your journalistic sleuthing. <laughs> we um, have our very, talents. <laughs> very thorough. Um, what's clear is that this is a category that needed a human-centric innovation shakeup, and that's what Flex has clearly done. Now, Lauren was also sharing a lot of wisdom with us, and all of it was incredibly applicable. So what were your key takeaways? Aligning with our DNA of a gutsy brand that we like to think about, I'll start with how clearly this company leads with empathy. Lauren had personal experiences that really accelerated that empathy, right? She suffered for a number of years um, in ways that were deeply personal to her. And at the end of the day, her mission and, and Flex's mission is to provide comfort. They want to solve the multitude of emotion laden frustrations that exist in this category. And they're doing all of this for menstruating humans. 
it's such an obvious display of empathy. It checks that box. Number one, don't you think? Yeah, it definitely does. That was very obvious, especially when you innovate from something so personal, how could it be anything but empathy? I think at that point. Yeah. And gutsy brands stand behind bold ideas. And I think Emily, my favorite part of this discussion is when Lauren described pitching the investor community, which was primarily male, and they just didn't get it. They Mm -hmm. didn't understand that this was a big market opportunity. So what did she do? She made it personal. She reframed the pitch to appeal to their personal experiences that is being denied sex from their partner when she was on her period. And all of a sudden they get it. So what a powerful way to state your case, make it personal and that conviction and that reframing allowed her to really launch the bold idea. I, I love that part. It's my favorite part. It's so good. And I, I love when you said, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I wish. And in terms of pioneering new paths, you know, having been a direct to consumer brand and entering mainstream retail and a lot of the gutsy brands um, interviewees that we talked to they've embarked on that journey, right? Going from one retail or one distribution channel to another. So she was so generous in in sharing about those challenges, specifically cash management that it created. So embarking on a new distribution channel, it creates so many new things to think about. But what I love most about that, why did she think going to mainstream retail was important? Do you remember what she said? The whole reason that they, yeah, that they did that? she said, uh, well, when people are traveling, they want access to the product or maybe their period comes earlier unexpectedly. So just being available to those people. Right. It's grounded in empathy, right? So when mm-hmm. you're following that human need, chances are you're doing the right thing. And chances are the challenges that you're facing are worth working through because it's, it's providing solutions that people really need in their lives. So I think that was a really clear illustration of another aspect of, of gutsy DNA. And finally at gut check, what we call the power of, and seeing opportunities where others force trade-offs. If you check out the features of the flex product, it just challenges the status quo. Does a period product need to be cotton? Does it need to be disposable? Does it need to be swapped out several times throughout the day? This is a company and a brand that looked at each of those, what could be perceived as barriers that cannot be overcome and flip things upside down. It's such a great example of technical innovation that truly does see opportunity where others forced compromise. So I'm super enthused by our discussion. I took a lot of lessons away that I will, I will implement as a leader. And again, gave me another brand to be really um, excited about and support. So I hope our listeners enjoy it. I hope they do too. I know I did. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Gutsiest Brands podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. If you like what you're hearing, please consider sharing our episode with a friend and leaving us a five-star review. See you next time.